first I have to apologize to Gabby because I didn't get this video done before 9 p.m. Eastern time, which is her internet curfew. So Gabby, that's my fault. I went on a great hike today. I might send you guys links to pictures. And I'm in an undisclosed location, namely Nevada, Missouri, where I might be for two or three nights doing top secret work that involves performing on stage. Um, one of the things in the David and Goliath story that struck me, we're all pretty familiar with that story, though there are some little hidden gems in it. One of the things that struck me in rereading it was the attitude of David's older brother and probably brothers to him is quite similar to the attitude of the older brothers toward Joseph, who was the second from the youngest. Uh, they're quite contemptuous. At least Eliab, the eldest brother, is pretty contemptuous of David. He doesn't think much of him. You see, it's difficult to be a prophet in your hometown and certainly in your home. At any rate, that's a story that everyone knows, and normally it's used to talk about David's trust in God um, and the ability of faith to overcome a kind of brute force. The height of Goliath, incidentally, is not that different from the tallest man on record, the Alton Giant. In fact, I might send you a link to a picture of him because he was from Alton, Illinois, just upriver from St. Louis. And there's a big statue of him, a life-size statue of him, he was over nine feet tall, which is what Goliath would have been, though they give his weight in cubits. But let's talk about 1 Corinthians 15, which is, I think, the most visionary of all of St. Paul's writings. So I'm going to go to um, my Kindle, and we'll take a look at a couple things. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. See, St. Paul goes right to it. He's not beating around the bush. Also, we have earlier, uh, for since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. Uh, that's probably from the King James Version. And that's, of course, in Handel's Messiah. One of the things that listening to great music will do for you is so many songs, classical music songs, refer to scripture. So for me, that's always going to stick in my mind because of Handel's Messiah. Since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. And then, of course, he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet, and the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Even death will be destroyed. But then the way Paul describes it, verse 27, for he hath put everything under his feet, now, when it says that everything has been put under him, it is clear that this does not include God himself, who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him, so that God may be all in all. Now, does this mean that the second person of the Holy Trinity is lower than God the Father? I don't think so. I think what it means is Christ continually reenacts the emptying of himself and the great act of humility, which was the which was the incarnation and which was the passion and crucifixion. Christ's entire life on earth was a tremendous act of subjection, subjecting himself to the authority of the Father. This is why when he is baptized, and, and John the Baptist says, I should rather be baptized by you, Jesus says, we must, it is best for us to obey the law as it is. This is why he is circumcised on the eighth day. This is why um, he, is pre, he is baptized and why he is presented in the temple and all of these things. He obeys the law, even though he is the author of the law. And at the end of time, when even death will be destroyed, when he, and as we go back to screen share, will be made subject to him who put everything under him, then God may be all in all. In the same way that Chesterton says, 
that awful moment on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That awful moment on the cross when God himself seemed abandoned by God and when in a way God even became a rebel and when in a way God almost was an atheist. In other words, somehow the life of Christ encompasses everything. God is all in all because he has taken on himself anxiety, dread, fear, subjugation, obedience, humility, being despised, being disobeyed, being betrayed. There is nothing that we can experience that he somehow has not experienced himself as a man. God becomes all in all in this final act of inner worship in the Trinity and inner obedience in the Trinity, inner subjugation in the Trinity. And so when we push back against St. Paul talking about wives being subordinate to their husbands, we need to understand that this subordination is the opposite of insubordination. In other words, there is a proper subordination, subordering of things. And Christ, who could claim the top, does what Satan will not and voluntarily subordinates himself to the Father, God then becoming all in all. And then finally, in 1 Corinthians 15, and as we make our way through it, it gets more and more stirring. Um, if I fought wild beasts in Ephesus with no more than human hopes, what have I gained? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. And then he reminds them, do not be misled, bad company corrupts good character, quoting Menander. Come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning. For there are some who are ignorant of God. I say this to your shame. And then he goes back to the theme of resurrection. But stop sinning. You're ignorant of God. And you're ignorant of God because you think we have only human hope. If we have only human hope, then all we can do is try to build the utopia and make everybody miserable in the process. If our hope is only for this life, then let us eat and drink for tomorrow we must die. Outrageously, our hope is in something beyond death. We don't want to admit that in the church these days, but St. Paul insists upon it and then slaps us around a bit. We need to stop sinning because there are some of us who are ignorant of God and ignorant of God's plan for us even after death, for death itself will be defeated. Wishful thinking, that's what Freud said. Crazy, it's crazy, but if it's true, then perhaps we have a sense of where all our joy actually comes from and actually points to.